Uh, my name is Klaus Kasperk. I come from Copenhagen Economics, also in Sweden. Uh, just a reflection on this issue about the preparation of, um, of uh, expert witness. I'm myself an expert witness, and I have participated in cases also where we have had mock trials. And I will li listen to the first discussion here this morning here, where lawyers, they devise special tactics to control witnesses in order to make them tell their side of the story. Then I think expert witnesses that appear again and again in court, they have to develop counter strategies because they don't want to be used as tools for the other side. So we need to break out of the leading questions and we need to be able to make other answers than just yes or no. And in order to do that, we need to develop counter strategies and we need to train in order to do that. Not because we want to be advocates and be lawyers, but because we want to give our, uh, our version of the story and not the version of the story that has been structured and planned by either the other one side or the other side. So that my question would be, uh, I, was, I, like, I, was, I think I would like to come back to that later today. What kind of counter strategies should we as expert witnesses uh, prepare for? Well, one strategy was developed by a very good friend of many of ours in the room, Wolfgang Peter, with his witness conferencing, witness hot tubbing idea. I agree with Wolfgang about many things, but not on this one because what it does is it removes control of the case from counsel and places it in the hands of tribunal members who probably don't know the file as well as counsel at that stage. And frankly, if they were from a background where they weren't very good at asking questions, if they were an advocate, they don't materially get better by moving to the other side of the table as a tribunal member. And so lots of time can get wasted, in my humble opinion, in witness conferencing. But let me ask the tribunal what they think, because that was a technique that was designed specifically to take the counsel out of the picture and allow experts to talk and meet on separate issues. Who wants to take a shot at that now that I've been so calm and unreserved in my criticism? Don't mind taking a shot. Hillary? I, what I have done once quite um, successfully was to do a hybrid. In other words, I, it was quite a short expert um, issue, uh, and I, it took the day. The morning, I gave counsel an opportunity to cross-examine. I sent the experts off to lunch with sandwiches together and said, in the light of that, see what you can agree. And then in the afternoon, I asked them some questions and then gave counsel an opportunity to ask further questions. Uh, and I find it very productive from an arbitrator perspective. I don't know what counsel thought. Uh, but it, what was particularly interesting was that the witness was very guarded in answering the questions from counsel. But when I asked the questions, they opened up a lot more and enabled me as the tribunal to understand. It also gave me an opportunity to ask questions on areas I was a bit not clear about. So I found that in that particular case useful. Um, I think it varies from case to case. Um, just to, to pick up one other point, which I think emerges from your question, the closed question, one thing that I do notice is that my style of cross-examination in the UK is very different from, say, the US style of cross-examination, which permits very much of a closed answer. So the, the US style will very much uh, lead to getting a yes or no answer much more than the style that we use, and other countries do it differently. So it very much depends, I think, on the style of the cross-examiner um, as to how, how the sort of um, flexibility you have to embellish your answer. Um, and then there are sometimes people who jump up and down and, and stop the answer being yes or no, but sometimes um, you've got to put a rider in order to understand what the answer is or to qualify the answer. Jim, before I call on you, let me ask the judge, in your proceedings at the Law of the Sea conference, was there a cross-examination?
because the time available is limited. But still, we have had a certain number of occasions uh, in which um, witnesses were called and cross-examination was conducted. Um, I must say that from the bench, you have the impression of, of course, this is an international tribunal with uh, parties from all over the world. You, you have the impression of different degrees of preparation. And I'm not alluding especially or only to the preparation of witnesses, but also preparation of the lawyers. Uh, sometimes you have the impression, especially from non-common law lawyers, which often appear in front of international tribunals, uh, that they, are, they have maybe a short script, but they are more or less improvising the questions depend and then the further question depending on what is the answer. And when it comes to cross-examination, uh, I have seen non-common uh, law lawyers uh, be quite in a difficulty and sometimes ask questions that were in fact <laughs> to be avoided according to all the rules we have heard today and certainly counterproductive for the cause. And when we have lawyers, which are also often uh, pleading before the international tribunals f with a British or American background, you have the impression that they know more what this is all about. The uh, questioning, both direct and cross, is more focused and uh, uh, mistakes are often avoided. May I just tell a, a little episode from my more or less personal experience when Italy as a state uh, had a case against the United States, the LC case, which was decided by the International Court of Justice uh, 50, 25 years ago or so. Uh, we had to build up a team, and we had perhaps among the, the best international lawyers from Italy and also the best business law lawyers, a really uh, formidable team. But we felt that on matters where there was a lot of fact, a lot of American facts, it was a question of diplomatic protection exercised by the U.S. government on, a, on American firms, we needed something with a special experience. And so, well, we inquired around and we hired uh, the late uh, Keith Hyatt from Curtis. <laughs> so, and uh, indeed, he handled all the interrogations and cross-examinations in a way that even the best uh, continental law lawyer wouldn't be able to do. So I think uh, this is a question of being accustomed to do this. For most Italian, but I would think continental law lawyers, all the things we have been here today would be quite new. And uh, maybe they would even think that it's not consonant to the task of counsel prepare a kind of theater show <laughs> that would impress the judge. Well, coming to another point that was raised before, and uh, here put on another hat. Uh, I have been once an uh, expert witness in Italian law before an American court, and I can, and in this case, there was a direct examination of the witness followed by cross-examination. I can testify that the witness feels much more comfortable if the whole thing starts with direct examination. I think you're absolutely right about that. Jim, you had a point? Following on with that and, and uh, dealing with the question of experts and their strategies for confronting the uh, confronter, 
I don't follow Ben's practice of saying at the outset you're going to have 20 minutes on direct. I say at the outset your witness statement is going to stand as, as direct, but we're going to allow a reasonable amount of, uh, of direct. And then when we get closer to the hearing, we actually discuss what that's going to mean for various witnesses. And any good expert, given 20 minutes or thereabouts, can really do a lot of damage. That you can tell, you don't have to do all of the background of how I did my work and what I came to. You just explain why you're right and the opposing guy's wrong. That's the best strategy, not to fight with a cross-examiner. And of course, then there's some, an opportunity for redirect. I wanted to say on the subject of witness uh, conferencing, or even worse, hot tubbing, uh, I think like most Americans, we really, really don't like it. It's, uh, it's been the custom for a long time to have witnesses who are expert on the same subject testify back to back, basically, so they have, have to confront seeing each other, and one will get up and say, here's where we really disagree. But trying to get them to sit down and agree on something when their lawyers are looking over their shoulder, even if they're not allowed in the room, in my experience, has been very counterproductive. You just get something that recites each side's side. And if you put them in a hot tub and then put, as Hillary says, the pressure on the arbitrator to uh, take the lead or at least part of the lead in doing the examination, that may work if the subject is damages or something that we as lawyers are reasonably accustomed to dealing with. But if it's uh, a, a highly technical subject, nuclear engineering or something, uh, it's pretty hard to put the arbitrators in the position of leading that examination. And I had a case in Australia that I was the chairman of where the witnesses, uh, God help us, uh, decided that they wanted five experts all in the jury box to be examined because they covered two or three different specialties. And they agreed that in this instance, they'd, they'd let the lawyers take the lead and the arbitrators would kind of follow up. But you, you have the normal human situation. Some people will be more dominant personalities than others. They will get their elbows out, jump up, and uh, be more aggressive in responding to questions. And they, uh, some will be less effective at that. And it, uh, it turns the whole thing into a different kind of show. It also puts a premium on experts becoming uh, excellent thespians and actors. Um, and, and that is a rewarded skill in that concept. Robert? Yeah, no, I just wanted to follow up on Jim's point, which I agree with 100% about uh, being an expert witness. Uh, and I think it is counterproductive almost for an expert to try to develop a counter strategy to try to get their case out again in, in cross-examination. Uh, because even if you're not trying to be an advocate for the case, um, you know, you are in effect uh, coming, off, coming off that way. And I think that the most arbitrators will not like that. Um, it's important to remember, you've had the chance to get your case out in your report, uh, maybe had a chance to repeat the highlights of that report in your presentation and in, in direct. Uh, that work is done, it's already out there. It's the other side's chance to highlight the weaknesses in your report now. And uh, if you're trying to evade those questions, if you're trying to you, you know, if you're not admitting a, we a weakness in, in the report that has to be admitted, um, then I think you may be actually uh, coming across as an advocate for the, for the party and, and per perhaps less credible as an expert. So, so certainly I think the best counter strategy is just to um, stick to your own opinions and concede what needs to be conceded and affirm what you truly believe needs to be affirmed. Any other questions at that point before I move on to a slightly different subject? Seeing none, <clears throat> let's uh, drill down a little bit in the differences between preparing to cross factual witnesses and expert witnesses. We've started raising some of those issues in connection with our hot tub discussion. I guess we should start with the notion, first of all, are there any differences? I mean, I'll give you an example. Sometimes law is proved as a question of fact. Sometimes it's pre proved through expert witnesses. We see traditional expert witnesses in the engineering case, and in the words of the expression, sometimes it really is rocket scientists, and you do have rocket scientists that are on the stand. So preparing for some of those types of witnesses, how do you make sure that your side's themes come through out of the other side's experts? Or do you decide that 
Maybe their presentation was so impenetrable and dense that <clears throat> you wouldn't want to give them another opportunity to straighten it out. I mean, what are the kinds of considerations? And the reason I ask it this way is because it plays off a comment that we got from the judge, and that is many times in proceedings I have the feeling that civil law lawyers feel compelled to ask questions because they think that there must be cross-examination. But the truth is, the real art, as opposed to the science of cross-examination, is more importantly demonstrated by knowing what not to ask and who not to ask it of. Because more cases are lost by bringing to information out that did not have to be brought out than are won, as we see in a typical Hollywood movie fashion, or at least that's my thesis. Takers? Um, I think one point that one does often see is that if you get a good answer from witness A on a point, leave it. Don't ask the same question to witness B, who might give you a different answer, much less favorable. You've got your answer. Um, and that, I think, is a very common mistake. So far as the difference between experts and factual witnesses, well, again, I mean, each case is different. But, I mean, more of a generalization, I suspect, in, if you were just taking it generally, is with the experts, you're trying more to get the uh, expert to agree with the propositions of your expert. So it's more to try and elicit agreement. In the context of a factual witness, there will be situations where you want them to agree, but often or more often, you're trying to uh, really demolish or try and put holes into their case. And so the approach may be slightly different. Um, as I said, it's very much a generalization because each case is, is very different and each witness is very different, uh, how you approach the witness, uh, and it depends on, on, on the particular facts of the case and the witness. Anybody else? I think one of the big things that's a difference in the preparation is that the lawyer has to really become an expert in the technical subject. Because if you wade into an expert cross-examination without being able to essentially understand the full import of the questions that you are asking, the expert, if he's been well prepared and um, experienced, will run circles around you. Uh, and that will become obvious for the tribunal. And you will see a situation where the tribunal's questions will then piggyback exactly on what the expert did to you and the case gets rapidly out of control. So cross-examining an expert witness, I believe, is fundamentally different from trying to deal with a factual witness. It's the rare factual witness that's going to stand up and go toe-to-toe -to -toe with a lawyer. Some people are personality, but you see this in the construction field a lot, where they're not intimidated by anybody or anything. You would see it in some of the government contracting context cases and things like that and maybe in some of the high-powered financial cases where you have the Wolf of Wall Street type personality. But as a practical matter, factual witnesses are generally so new to the process that they're much easier, if you're carefully prepared, to lead around to the points that you want to try to get made. The mistake that most people make with factual witnesses is they take far too long. The truth of the matter is, unless it is a massive undertaking, cross-examination of almost no witness should take more than 30 minutes because the tribunals start to get sympathetic to witnesses. So you need to make your points and you need to sit down as quickly as possible when you have made your points because otherwise, the longer it goes on, and I've seen it on both sides of the table, the natural empathy of watching somebody squirm comes to their rescue by tribunal members who may have no real appreciation for the questions that they're asking because it's early enough in the case, but they do it in such an open-ended fashion that everything that you just got established on the record has now been completely undone, and all of that time was essentially wasted. Factual experts, then, are completely different animals than experts. Um, you really need to be able to understand where the vulnerabilities are 
of a technical expert. And that means you have to spend a lot of time with your own experts getting ready for that. Because whether it plays out in Hillary's example of we're going to let the experts go away and then come back and we're going to ask some questions. So it's almost that symbiotic preparedness between your own expert because you may not know what the tribunal is going to recommend. We did a case recently where on the morning of the ninth day of hearing, without having had any application for it made by the other side, the chairman of the tribunal walked in and decided that he wanted to witness conference all of the witnesses that had just been testifying for the last four days. Of course, we'd put some of them on planes because they'd been excused. I mean, it was a completely ill-considered, ill-conceived notion, but he was unshakable, and we actually spent the rest of the hearing day doing other cleanup things so we could get people back on airplanes to do this. And, of course, it was a disaster, not from our client's perspective, because everything fortunately turned out well, and the witnesses had been well prepared, and the other side's witnesses had never hot tubbed at all, so I can't complain about the result, but I can sure complain about the procedure, because that's the kind of thing that you need to prepare for completely differently than a normal case. So we really have to know what the rules of the ground are going to be that we're going to, to be covering. Let's go down to a couple of other issues. We heard in the first panel about the merits of using electronic projections on separate screens. That's become quite common in a lot of high-stakes international arbitrations. It gives a tremendous advantage to the cross-examiner because you have at your fingertips all of the electronic images and sound bites that you wish to use. But I have seen pushback from many tribunals about that because they want the client to be able to see or the witness to be able to see the entire document rather than just a piece of it. And, of course, you lose the beautiful uh, utility of the screen when the blowout is then rendered the entire document. And then even if you have it highlighted, people spend so much time arguing about the process <clears throat> that you wind up using the physical document in many cases anyway. So let me ask the tribunal for their thoughts about the high-tech arbitration room and whether it's worth all it costs to make it happen. Ben? Let me, let me start with that. Well, I, uh, I think technology has its place, and if you can afford it, I think technology is a very good thing. Now, from my perspective, Mark was talking about the documents, I really find it much more easy to deal with hard copy documents. I work better with them. I'm just, maybe I'm a Luddite, but I like them. On the other hand, technology can be a wonderful tool. Now, I may be an outlier on this one, but I actually favor the PowerPoint presentation for opening and for closing. I, I know PowerPoints are a bit of an object of scorn, but I like them because well done, a PowerPoint is really a summary pleading done right and I'm not so interested in seeing that on the screen I, of course polite I'm looking at it I'm making my notes but what I like is that when the lawyer has finished his or her opening statement they hand each of us their PowerPoint presentation from the opening and from the closing and I can guarantee you David Haig mentioned his notes I'm a, a detailed note taker I look at my notes and I look at those PowerPoint summaries I think technology is is really wonderful now Technology doesn't have to be that high tech. For example, this if you got a really great document, put it on a, about a 40 by 50, not the little one, just a poster board where the document, you've got an icon of the document, and a blowout with just the language. No more than 15, 20 words in the document. So lots of ways to do it. But when we're talking about technology, take even the simple, the flip charts with the markers, Mixed message, anything that will make it more interesting and, and visible. But in answer to your question, at least from my point of view, if we're into the issue of we're talking fine specking a document and witness, uh, Mark, I like to have that document before me, typically in a cross notebook for this witness. Any other reactions to that, Judge, and then Jim? Well, just to work on, on this high tech uh, part. Well, also in international uh, tribunals, uh, 
uh, we, there's a lot of use of screens and technologically prepared um, argument. I, I think uh, a good, uh, let's say, electronic background may be a very useful help for the pleader. So I think, for instance, in maritime border disputes, to show on the screen the map and then the line according one side, the line according the other side, the, and the possible lines in the middle. This is more eloquent than a five minute speech. And, the, and in fact, you <laughs> happen to see in, in the International Court of Justice or in arbitration tribunals on these subjects that the geographical experts who are also experts in high tech become as key to the discussion as the lawyers. And in fact, the market for these people is even tighter than that for the very good lawyers. Jim? I guess you need to remember uh, when you're using technical uh, assistance that, that puts you also in the hands of your tech person. And things can go wrong, uh, and often do. And, the, uh, the same kind of fumbling with documents that aggravates judges and tribunals when people are doing it uh, with hard copies can happen when you're electronics. They can't find the right document. They can't highlight it. Everybody's sitting there waiting anxiously. It has its downside. But uh, various people have touched on the issue of what you do physically with exhibits with witnesses on cross-examination. And some people favor uh, a separate volume of the, that you hand the witness and the arbitrator so you can follow along. It's got an advantage, although if the arbitrators have their set of documents that they're annotating, that means they're seeing the same document five different times in different hard-bound uh, books, all of which kind of pile up in the background, and that has a disadvantage. You can hand out the individual documents, at the, and then you have your electronic guy highlighting things at the same time, all kind of effective. I like as an arbitrator, I have the physical document, but I then am happy to read what they're highlighting on the screen. But if you've got all of those things going on at the same time, uh, the arbitrator's got his or her set of documents. You've handed out a hard set for each of those witnesses, and there's somebody scrambling to try to find the right paragraph on the screen. It can get a bit circus-like. It also makes for a very difficult record to read after the fact. <clears throat> Sophie told us about the importance of reading the record to many arbitrators, but to try to do that after you've had that dialogue about, well, I'm really talking about this section of the screen. Well, the screen, of course, is no lawyer before you. People often don't use the reference number. Tribunals have to police that. So it makes the job of the tribunal, which after all is the object of the exercise, much more difficult, I think, to do that. I think in, I'm sort of in Ben's camp on this. I think you get a blend of the technology to really emphasize the important points. But the truth is most arbitrators that I appear in front of like to write notes, just like David was telling us. And they, where do I want them to have the notes? I want them to have the notes on the documents that they're going to be reviewing when they're writing the award. They don't get that with a screen. Has anybody else had experience using high-tech methods they'd like to talk about? Let's switch topics then. Let's everybody put on our tribunal hats. <laughs> 